Hi, my name is Brad Sanqua. I am a historian with a PhD from the University of Ottawa, where I focus on Canadian military history. I've already done a video like this where I looked at uh, several heritage minutes uh, connected to the First World War put out by Historic Canada. Again, these are very popular in Canada. And when I was younger, as I said in the last video, they were everywhere. Television all the time uh, became kind of sort of very popular, but also kind of joke some of them. Uh, if some of you know what I'm talking about, certain ones about surgeries. Uh, you know what I'm talking about if you've seen them. Uh, anyway, so today I figured I'd go through the Second World War because some people have been asking me to, to kind of do this again. And it's Canada Day today as I'm recording this. So it seems like a good day to, uh, to dig in some heritage minutes and, and, and see what we've got. Again, just like the last time, uh, seen some of these many, many times. Some of them are newer, some of them are older. Some I'm not sure I've seen. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to, once I get into it, I'll, I'll let you know my thoughts. So what I'll do is uh, let them run uh, so you can see them in their gallery <laughs> if you've never seen them before. And then I'll kind of give my thoughts after uh, for each one of them. There's not too many of them because I'm just using the playlist put together uh, by Historic Canada themselves. Uh, so if you like these videos, let me know. I can do other ones too. I think there's a bunch of 1812 ones. Uh, all kinds of different stuff. So I could do some more later if you want. So you can leave a comment below and let me know uh, if there's ones you'd like to hear or, or see about. That would be great. So let's get it going and uh, see what we got for us today. This is the BBC. Here is the news. Dauntless Canadian troops beat back hitherto invincible German forces on Normandy's Juno Beach today. Well, and this is Canadian Armed Forces Radio. There's something that really matters. That great, great hit by Toronto's own Ruth Flood. <laughs> Musician and broadcaster John Lombardi would continue to play a prominent role in our popular culture for another half century. True. Well, double time! But not before he and the men of the 7th Canadian Infantry had earned the world's gratitude for what they did at Juno Beach. So that's an interesting one. Um, really well done, I think, in terms of set dressing and, and uniforms and that kind of thing. So I'll just play again and uh, give some quick thoughts. So Lombardi is part of the Queen's Own Rifles, uh, a trial unit um, that was part of the first wave uh, on Juno Beach. Uh, and he was from Toronto, so uh, it's a really good fit, right? Which isn't always how it went, right? There wasn't always guys in their, their geographic unit, uh, but Lombardi was part of the 7th Brigade, as it's mentioned at the end there. It lands near the famed uh, Canada House, which was Queen's Own Rifles House for quite some time. So I think that's what this part's trying to depict here with the seawall and all that. And again, there's this random firing that did happen on the day. Just random German pockets left would uh, fire randomly at the beach. But not before he and the men of the 7th Canadian... So they did push inland, obviously, during the day. They were just sitting on the beach, but it, I get why. It makes a good set. Uh, piece to do here. So the next video is looking at uh, Mona Parsons, which is a really, really interesting story that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. No, no, no. I'm telling you, I was in a German prison camp for four years. What's going on here, Sergeant? I mean, she's a Canadian, sir, but she could be a German spy. What's your name, lady? Mona Parsons. Mona Parsons? From Wolfville. It's me. Harry Foster. Gosh, what happened to you? I was in the resistance. The Gestapo got me. Yeah, they did. 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 Living in Holland during the war, Mona Parsons had helped down to Allied Airmen get back to Britain. I will escape. And she did escape. And back in Nova Scotia after the war, she married General Harry Foster. Yeah, so this is a very interesting story. Um, I don't know the details as well as I probably should, uh, but uh, it's a great story. She does escape, which is fantastic and, and crazy in the story. And the Heritage Minute really helped bring this to light to a lot of people. Um, so Mona Parsons, yeah, like they said, helped. 
uh, down airmen escape and things like that. You got caught, she escaped. Uh, so it's amazing. And just the, 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 the coincidence of this is actually quite amazing. So they did think she, they weren't really sure who she was because, you know, we're torn Europe. At the end there was quite confusing who was who, all kinds of displaced people, that kind of thing. Uh, but Harry Foster is an interesting character in himself, um, leads the Canadians at Kiska uh, and is in Normandy. Uh, he's famously connected to Kurt Meyer, all that stuff, book written by his son, which is all kinds of confusing. Uh, a whole other story here. But the, the main of this is Parson's story, which is utterly fantastic and is covered by so many people and it, it deserves the attention it, it gets. It's just fantastic. It's, it's a great heritage and a great Canadian story that definitely more people should know about. And you can find the details of her story very easily online. They're all over. And she did escape. It's a great one. So I really commend Historical Canada for this one, especially. So the next Heritage Minute looks at uh, Tommy Prince, which is just another one of those stories that's almost unbelievable, uh, unless you know it. Um, if you've never heard of him before, look him up, um, and I'll get into it after this. So my thoughts on this one, I've got quite a few more on this one than uh, some of these other videos. When Tommy Prince went behind enemy lines, the enemy was that time in Enzio. But three days on his own, he trained our guns. He never time. boasted about his army time, never said nothing. One of the few non-Americans ever awarded the Silver Star of the United States, Tommy Prince. He was the bravest man I ever seen. But after Italy and France, and then twice in Korea, he had to fight the battles of peacetime in a community where Canadian Indians have it hard. Poverty, which would claim his many, many medals. He had to fight the drink, and he did and family troubles, and he did. And he died in dignity, one of the most decorated soldiers in Canada's history, Tommy Prince of the Ojibwe Nation. And Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry are honored to say farewell to one of our own. So Tommy Prince, uh, a guy, a soldier, um, Poorly treated uh, after his service, both in the Second World War and Korea, uh, re-enlisted in Korea. Uh, that's where the PPCLI connection comes in. He was in the first Special Service Force, is what they're talking about when they mention ANZIO, uh, which was American-Canadian unit combined. They fought together uh, one, as one and the same. Uh, Prince was part of that. Uh, later broken up in the war after the landings in southern France as part of Dragoon. Uh, anyway, so he was everywhere. He did all kinds of crazy things. His story is, again, unbelievable, uh, but it's all true. And he was let down by the state of Canada and the country and the people around him. Uh, he was just very much poorly, poorly treated. So this is his obviously preparing for his funeral uh, after he dies. The story of him and Anzio, he you know, pretended to be a, a soul, a, an Italian farmer, which is just insane. And he got away with it. And he had family trouble. He had alcoholism. Uh, and just didn't get the help he needed. He tried his best, but he needed help, like a lot of soldiers do. And he lost his, his family, was taken away from him, his children. He he had to pawn his medals, which have been bought back by the Ojibwe Nation, uh, part of his band. His band, sorry, has bought them back, um, which is a fantastic story. I mean, it was I heard stories about the auction itself, and it's, it's just a fantastic that they were able to get those back because he pawned them for money, uh, which is just heartbreaking. Uh, and he died young, of course, 77 there, you see. So it's just it's, it's a heartbreaking story that... We still need to do better, and I think this is Prince's story should be one that we know and know that we need to do better because we let down this guy who did so much for Canada, and Canada did nothing for him. So this next one looks at um, veterans returning home from the Second World War, which I have quite a few thoughts about. If you've been watching stuff on the channel, then it kind of deals with this. I, I have quite a few thoughts on this one, and I'll just let it play like I do, and I'll get into that a little bit. Please, if you'll just listen to me, the government is doing absolutely everything that it can. It's the minister. Every one of these men and some of these women have put their lives at stake for this country. And some of them have come home to, well, well, they've had no homes to come home to. 
Is that any way to treat citizens that have gone through what we have gone through? Council boosted veteran housing to 10,000 units and launched the country's post-war boom. The sheer moral force of the returning vets that prevailed. So veterans returning home from the Second World War. Uh, an interesting clip highlighting a bigger issue. Uh, I mean, they're literally talking about housing, which was a massive issue during the war. There was just not enough housing to hold everybody. Uh, and that was changed after the war. That's kind of what they're talking about there with the, the mortgages and everything, and then literally the building of the houses. I mean, any major Canadian city still has these houses left. I mean, they're tiny, they're quickly made. Uh, they're in a lot of the older parts of the cities now, so you can easily pick them out if you know what you're looking for. Uh, so that kind of helped that issue. Uh, so and this is just more general thought here, the the, the veterans uh, charter and everything that was passed after the war to give them you know schooling and farm loans and all that stuff. It was great. It was one of the better programs. I'm not denying that. But some veterans needed more help than others, uh, particularly ones who had been in long POW camps and suffered medical issues because of that incarceration. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, a number of those in Europe had issues uh, that were not dealt with, were literally, almost literally tried to be pushed under the rug, just veterans organizations wouldn't let it happen. So yes, the, the Veterans Charter and all of that was done for them after the war deserves to be uh, commended, uh, but we could have done better. Uh, for those who needed more help and they fought for it and some of them just never got it unfortunately they died before anything was done to help them with the help they actually needed so the housing issue is it was one that they did fix and it did help the country overall right it did, they're right they helped the boom it helped everyone kind of get established after the war which led canada into its post-war boom that it's forgotten they were trying to avoid kind of an economic downturn that had fall the first world war so this is a really interesting angle to take on it, right, with the wounded uh, who are recovering from wounds. I mean, it's more of a, a, a visceral way to do it. It gets attention. I mean, this will collapse a little much. Uh, it's like something on a social media post or something. Like, oh, they clapped after I finished my speech. You know, it's, it's a bit much, but sometimes that happens. Yeah, and they did help with the housing, which in turn just helped the country in general, which I think is often forgotten that these things cost money up front, but they can do tons of benefits in the long run. Units and launch the country's post war boom. The sheer moral force of the Yeah, which is great. It's great stuff. This one's going to be looking at Marion Orr, and I'll just let this one kind of play, and, and you'll see the story. This is one I know I've seen many, many times. It's a bit older, I believe. Spitfire delivery from Coventry, sir. It sounds like air to ground, but it can't be. Nobody could fly in this suit. Pardon He's right. It is a Spitfire. Hang on. We've got a delivery left. Lad, in this. Lads! What's on landing, sir? Any chance we're even flying a day like this? Thanks, Corporal. Any chance it's breaking up? We got another one this afternoon. No idea, sir. Um, ma'am. 279 ferry assignments. I suppose your dream is to break 200. You know what my dream is? To go home when this is all over. Find a grass strip somewhere in Ontario. Teach flying. The car is ready. Gentlemen. Mary and Orr would achieve her dream and become the first woman in Canada to run a flying school. Mm -hmm. So this is a good one too, just talking about an uh, underappreciated story of the war, of the, the ferrying of uh, aircraft, which was hugely important and Canada played a big role in that one too. And women, a huge number of women played a very, very important role in it. That just somehow gets forgotten. Um, well, I know why, but it's not good. Uh, but this is an interesting one. It's a bit stereotypical Brit, you know, so the blimey. <laughs> it's kind of funny, a little bit. Get a little stereotypical here. It's just, it's a, it's a bit much uh, with the stereotypes and the, the characters. But, 
but it's a, it's a good one. It's good to bring you know attention to this story, which I think is always the best bet. Or sorry, the best thing are these these heritage minutes is bringing the attention that these stories often don't get. So I think that's why these are amazing. No matter like if there's you know you know historical accuracies that it doesn't really matter. It's the story is this. Good. And her starting a flying school is just amazing, just generally. Because I just get more and more interested in this aviation stories, and then like, it's, it's amazing. They hear these over and over again. Love it. That's great. That's fantastic. So here's the story of Andrew Minarski. I've told this one many times on social media, and it's very, very well known, but uh, still worth seeing the Heritage Minute in its full. It's a fantastic story. <laughs> you tell Gunners. Minarski, Brophy, get some sleep. We have a mission in exactly six hours. Good night, sir. <laughs> I can't hold it, man. Everybody fail now. It's no use, man. It's the damn thing's jam. Minarski, jump. That's an order. I gotta get Brophy clear. Jump for God's sake before it explodes. Brophy trapped in his turret miraculously survived the crash to tell of the heroism of Andrew Minarski, BC, who died of his burns. So this is literally just, I, I've heard this story I don't know how many times, uh, just, uh, just give me chills, like literally, uh, uh, it's just, it, the story is just, it, it's, uh, it's hard to describe, honestly. <laughs> So yeah, this little running joke they had, um, even though Minarski was about to be promoted, uh, and he was after the fact, that after he was killed. So they were buddies, so it's just funny, you know, they get in a joke. Uh, this story is, is intense. And I just went through Lancaster recently, a couple days ago, and it's so claustrophobic in there. So him, that he was able to do this, and kept going, is just amazing. I mean, this whole story is almost unbelievable. So Minarski did, he tried to go while he's on fire, as you can see here in a second. He's literally on fire trying to get Brophy out, which is just amazing. I mean, didn't give a care of himself, only trying to get Brophy out. He's on fire as he jumps, and then does the salute. And he gets out, but he, he doesn't He doesn't live. He, but Brophy does, which is, is insane. Right, like, you know. The fact that Brophy lived while being stuck in there as the tail gunner, uh, he was thrown clear of the crash, uh, wounded, but clear of the crash, and and lives to survive. I mean, they don't know about this story until after because he's taken as a prisoner of war. But uh, he, Marski's given the 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 Victoria Cross for his actions after Brophy he testifies that what he did, uh, and, and Minarski's been um, you know commemorated in so many different ways. I mean, he's literally got a name, a Lancaster, named after him at the, uh, the Canadian War Plane Heritage Museum uh, in Hamilton. It's, it's, it's an amazing story that we just, we know in Canada, but we could know better. This is like top-notch story here. It's, it, it's, 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 it's insane. I just, I'm having trouble finding the words for this one. So the next one up is John Osborne of Hong Kong. Um, I'll start by saying this is the one I probably know the best because this is my dissertation topic. I looked at uh, Osborne's life story, uh, also Lawson, who's involved in this one here. Uh, so I'll play it. I won't say anything yet, uh, and I'll save all my kind of commentary for after, and just let you kind of see it before I say anything. Listen, they never sent us any bloody jeeps, never mind artillery. Get out the chat. The chaps. The chaps are all over them. We're going outside now before they burn the place down. Come on, lads. I'm going to get us a Sir. He's down, sir! Boston's down! So's Hennessy! All right, fix bayonets! We move out of my orders! Grenade! 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 Our troops in Hong Kong were the first Canadians to see combat in the Second World War. 
and the war's first Victoria Cross for Canada was awarded posthumously to Sergeant Major John Osborne of Winnipeg. Okay, so uh, interesting video. Um, I'm glad, as I always am, that Hong Kong is attention. Uh, but this is bigger, part of a bigger, broader issue um, that I found to my dissertation is the, how Hong Kong is represented. Osborne is represented and is used a lot. Um, not that he didn't deserve it. So I'll get to that in a second. I, uh, these are two stories that are put together for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, they did not happen together. Uh, so let's we'll just tell it real quick here. So that first part there where, where that officer who's talking on the phone about not having artillery. Yes, there was limited artillery. Uh, so yes, transportation issues is a big part of the battle. That is J.K. Lawson, Canadian commander in Hong Kong. Uh, he was in a shelter as the Japanese were surrounding him and he does go to fight it out. He literally says that I'm going outside to fight it out and is killed. Uh, how he dies is, is still open to debate and questions. There's multiple accounts. Uh, he's not in a shelter like a building like that. Uh, he's in an actual kind of uh, bunker on the side of a hill. You can still see it today. It's near a gas station of all places. It's, it's, it's really interesting sight. So Lawson in and himself kind of literally goes down in a, in a you know, blaze of glory in this gunfight, right? It's almost like something out of a movie, uh, how he gets killed. Uh, so it's it, it's a fascinating story all in itself. Now Osborne, Sergeant Major Osborne, is nowhere near Lawson the entire time. Like they are not in the same building ever during this fight. Uh, they're nowhere close to each other. Osborne is on a different mountain, on a different day when he's killed. Um, so this is more of Osborne's story, obviously. They're in a building trying to hold off a, a Japanese attack after they had uh, withdrawn from a, uh, one of the mountains or hills in the area, in the, on the island. Uh, he covered the retreat all himself, uh, which was part of the story. Uh, so they went and returned to a building. So what they don't show here is it's not just one grenade. He's literally running around because they're surrounded. He's picking them up and chucking them out the window before they can explode. Uh, one, he doesn't get to in time. And he just screams at them to get down and he jumps on it and he's instantly killed. Uh, left behind children and a wife back in Canada, originally from Britain, actually served in the Royal Naval Division uh, for a very brief time on the Western Front. So he had some combat experience, one of the one of the one of the few actually at Hong Kong, the Canadians anyway. Uh, so it's an interesting story. I just think that they're both deserving of their own story here and, and, and aren't. So it's just unfortunate. So he's talking about here we don't have artillery. They had some, but they, no Canadian artillery came. He wanted Lawson wanted artillery, but just ran out of time. So this blowing of the doors happens. Uh, for Lawson, not for not for Osborne. He doesn't say anything about burning it down. He just he's like, we're gonna go out and fight it out because he knows there's no better. So Osborne's not there. They can put these two stories together, which I, I think is a mistake. Yeah, Hennessy and Lawson are killed. So this isn't quite how it goes, but close enough, I guess. So Lawson does sacrifice himself for his troops. He saw them as his own responsibility. I've seen the letters to his family talking about his responsibility to these men. And he dies, fulfilling it. A lot of them do survive, but then they're put in POW camps, right? So it's not good. Yeah, first army engagement and the first Victoria Cross. Uh, but it wasn't given until later, right? Because they didn't want to give uh, anything to the enemy on that front. So it's it's an interesting one. Uh, but it's, it's missing some... Uh, it's got some issues, I'll say. Um, so this next video looks at um, uh, troops in the first division who like served in Italy and then up to the Netherlands uh, at the end of the war. Here, we fought our way through Italy and then headed for Amsterdam, sweeping for Germans along the way. Our worst fear was to catch a bullet in these last hours of the war. It was very late. I was 15 when the Nazis invaded the Netherlands. More than a hundred thousand Dutch Jews never came home. Our men were put into forced labor. Yeah. By 1945, we were starving. Yeah. The food drops gave us hope. And then the Canadians came. Before Amsterdam, I couldn't have explained why we were there. All those years away from home. C4 Thailanders, yeah. Showed us why it mattered. Papa wanted me to bring some soldiers home to thank them personally. And that's when I first saw Will. And I invited him over that afternoon. Marguerite Blaise married Lieutenant Rolf Gildersleeve. Mm -hmm. They moved to Vancouver where they raised eight children. Today, the Dutch still remember the Canadians who liberated them. So there's another video that kind of gives me chills from watching it. I mean, the, the story of Canada and the Netherlands is well taught, uh, well known. I'm super appreciative of what the Canadians did for them. Uh, happening at the end of the Second World War there. 
fantastic story, especially the, the families that were created as a result. It's it's fantastic. We so this is a, a really good one. It's a more recent one as well. So it's really cool. I really like this one. I was 15 when the Nazis invaded the Netherlands. More than 100,000 Dutch Jews never came home. Yeah. Our men were put into forced labor. Yeah, a lot of that happened. We were starving. So the hunger winter, right? They were... Uh, Food was well, when they stopped when they struck during Operation Market Garden, so they cut food supplies off. So this is what you're seeing is the food drops of Operation Chowhound for the Americans, Operation Banner for the British Canadians, dropping food to them, and then they finally made their way in. Um, so it, it's it's a huge story, and the Netherlands are still completely appreciative. The tulips that are sent to Ottawa every year are the result of this. That's a fantastic story, uh, and the connections, like I already said, between the Netherlands and Canada are just fantastic. And they are so, so grateful to Canada and the sacrifices that were made for them. It's, it's amazing. So the next one looks at uh, Elsie McGill, uh, a great story. Uh, again, the role of women in Canada is becoming better and better known uh, during the war. Uh, more and more stories are coming to light and more and more getting more attention. Uh, but also, just real quick, I want to mention that the, the, the brain power of Canadians in the war is also underappreciated and what they were able to contribute in that area. I mean, not to disparage anybody else, right? But the Canadians played a role in that too. Uh, and this is one of those stories. Uh, it's a great one again, and it's great that it got the attention it deserves finally. And there's museum exhibits now about McGill and everything. It's, it's fantastic. <clears throat> you must be the reporter. Come with me. So, Miss McGill, how does it feel being Canada's famous women engineer? The real story is the work we've done retooling this factory. To build the Hawker Hurricane. Indeed. 40 planes last month with a capacity of up to 100. Our fighters are over England as we speak. Of course, it pains me to see airplanes mass produced like boxcars or baby carriages. But in war, we make concessions in favor of innovation. You must feel at home, though, managing all of these women. I'm not here to manage women. Well, you must admit it is an unusual job. I'm the chief engineer here. I do what engineers do. That's all. What are we doing now? We're going to win this war. We need to know how she flies. Elsie McGill was the world's first female aeronautical engineer. She oversaw Canada's production of Hawker Hurricanes during the Second World War, earning her the nickname Queen of the Hurricanes. Yeah, great story. The hurricane, 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 yeah. <laughs> you want to say it, uh, is uh, an important fighter, right? He gets kind of lost in this whole Spitfire thing. But uh, again, it's just like Miguel says, it's it's important. Uh, it's just, she did her job and she did it extremely well. Uh, very, very well getting these planes out because they were very, very much needed, especially, sorry, it's blocked there, but it's at Thunder Bay in 1940. Um, it's incredibly important. So I think it's just it's a cool video, kind of the subverting expectations. That kind of Come that kind me. of thing. So it's it's really cool, so, and I really like this one. Being famous so good old Thunder Bay, right? family from there. The it's amazing the what they were able to accomplish so quickly. Forty planes last month. So fast. Just, to up to Our are over Just cranking them out. <laughs> Nothing that the Axis could you know could match. Box cars or baby carriages, but in war. Yeah, do what you gotta do. In favor of innovation. So it's it's amazing. Feel at home, I was getting excited to see see women. the hurricane. Not here to manage women. And then a capacity. Oh, it is an unusual drop. I'm the chief engineer here. I do what engineers great stuff. do. That's all. Great, great stuff. What are we doing now? We're to win this war. We need to know how she flies. Just to see That's these flights would have been amazing. And to meet her would have been fantastic. She oversaw Canada's production of Hawker Hurricanes during the second this is world huge. war. Yeah, it's huge. It's massive. Fantastic. So that's all. Uh, that's the ones that they have on their playlist. Um, so again, if, 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 if you have some thoughts, let me know. Um, other ones you want me to see, because I don't think that's all the Second World War ones. Uh, I think there's some missing. So if there's ones you want to see, let me know. Uh, tell me your favorite. What's your favorite one? I mean, there's so many here. Tell me your favorite or something you think that they should cover. I mean, there's all kinds of stories that are not talked about, and I think they deserve some light as well. And the heritage events are still being made, so it's fantastic. Um, so they're just being more put out digitally, which is also great because that's what I do. So I love to see it. So they do great work. Uh, so give them support if you can. Uh, but also, if you can support my channel, that would be fantastic. So I can keep kind of doing this thing, giving my 
historian insights to these historical products. Um, so follow along on the channel if you can, subscribing, liking, commenting, all of that fun stuff. I also love to engage with you guys and talking to you guys. So please, please do, because I, I do my best to engage. I love it. I love talking history as much as I can. So please do. Uh, also become a patron if you can. Uh, it's really helpful for me. Just a few bucks a month makes a massive difference. Then I can keep doing more and more of this. The more support I have, uh, it's been getting amazing. The amount of support just more will allow me to do more. So, so please check that out. Everything's linked down below. And I'll link the uh, First World War reaction video as well down below. As you can see that, there's a great number of stories there as well um, connected to Canada's war. So yeah, so so let me know again what you want to see. If you want to see certain ones or you want me to just kind of do a mix, I can do that too. Let me know. So whatever you want to see is always, uh, always appreciated. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.